Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, so welcome everybody to the continuing education program on special care dentistry in collaboration with the New York State OPWDD Task Force on Special Needs Dentistry. Um, remember this evening you will receive one CE credit and um, we'll remind you of that at the end as well. Thank you all for joining. Some brief introductions. Um, of course, we have Dean Myers, and I wanted to put a picture of him there today, uh, since I know that he won't be able to join via picture um, on the webinar today. But Dean Myers is the Dean of Toro College of Dental Medicine. And of course, we also have Dr. Desenso, who is the Director of Special Needs, and myself, um, who collaborate together to put together this series for you. Um, and I just want to briefly go over too that Toro does have a giving page and these are non-taxable donations that will be used to support Toro Cares. And of course, we, we welcome any of those donations that you're able to, to give. Um, if you don't know about Toro Cares, on the next slide, it gives a little more information. Um, <clears throat> Toro Cares is a center for access, respect, empathy, and social justice, which will provide individuals with physical, emotional, and intellectual developmental disabilities, a unique clinical environment that specializes in providing oral health care to a population with limited or no access to dental care. And with your support, Toro Cares will become a reality and fill this critical need to service a marginalized portion of our community here in Westchester. So thank you for um, thinking of the potential to donate. <laughs> and we do have the New York State Academic Dental Center's Fellowship to Address Oral Health Disparities. We're proud at Toro to have the second fellow with us now, um, but we do still have five open spots in the other academic dental centers in New York State, which have a rolling admissions process right now. Um, so I just wanted to bring your attention to the fellowship. And we couldn't do these programs without the support of many of you. And I can't go through all of the names tonight, but we do genuinely thank you for collaborating with us. It takes you know a village to, to continue providing um, these continuing education series that are so important to, to dentists in our area in New York State. So thank you. <clears throat> and I wanted to introduce you all to Dr. Rick Rader. I'm honored that uh, he has given us his time today to present to us. I'm going to read his bio and I think you all will be very impressed that he's giving of his time today, tonight as well. Dr. Rick Rader is the director of the Morton J. Kenton Habilitation Center at Orange Grove in Tennessee, where he's responsible for the identification, implementation, and evaluation of innovative healthcare delivery programs for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities across the lifespan. He's cross-trained in internal medicine and medical anthropology, and his focus involves the biocultural determinants of health and disability. Dr. Rader was a presidential appointee at the National Council on Disability and co-authored the NCD's Health Equity Framework Report. Dr. Rader was the first appointed special liaison for family health care concerns at the President's Committee for People with Intellectual Disabilities and has been a consultant to five former Surgeon Generals in the area of health and disability. He's the president of the American Association on Health and Disability and has published over 350 articles in the area of health and disability and holds adjunct professorships in five medical schools as well as several dental schools. He wrote the introduction to the text, Treating the Dental Patient with Developmental Disorders. He, deserve, he serves on the board of Project Accessible Oral Health and is an emeritus advisor at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and also serves as a member of the Global Medical Advisory Committee at the Special Olympics International. He is a fellow of the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities and was elected to the National Academy of, pra of the Practice of Medicine. He's the past president and co-founder of the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry, or the AADMD, 
and serves as the Academy's Director of Public Policy and Advocacy. He's a member of the Executive Committee of Friends of the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He's a director of the Center on Aging, Dementia, and Longevity at the Orange Grove Center in Chattanooga. So I have no idea how we are so honored to have you this evening and you've given of your time, but we are very much looking forward to your uh, presentation today, Dr. Rader. Thank you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Shall we? Go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's not every day that somebody who's alive gets to hear the eulogy. So that <laughs> was uh, that was quite inspiring. Thank you very, very much. So I want to say greetings from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Basically, it is the home of um, of the Moon Pie, and uh, I'm a former fellow New Yorker, lived in Westchester, et cetera, and actually did my resident at the um, medical school at um, in, in Valhalla. So um, I'm ready to go. Ready? Okay. So, and I uh, want to send my best regards to uh, Dean Myers, who we hope the uh, he jumps back up really, really fast. So, I want to thank Dr. Myers, Dr. DeSeno, and Dr. Radowski for their invitation to speak to you tonight and for their enthusiastic support for adding Toro College of Dental Medicine to the growing list of dental schools who see the need, the, need, the, need, the, need, the, need, the opportunity, the opportunity and, the and the obligation to ensure that the next generation of dentists can handle the freight. So it's both expected and appropriate for clinicians who deliver lectures to provide disclaimers when they present. So I want to announce that I am not receiving any financial benefit for this presentation. That being said, Dean Myers did say he would spring for lunch if I made my way to Westchester, but he did add that it was going to be nothing more than a sandwich and chips. The other disclaimer is that I'm not a dentist, but somehow I got sucked into the vortex of oral health care for the underserved. So let me start with a quote I stumbled upon years ago when I discovered how people with disabilities always seem to get the short end of the stick. If a person has no place in the social system and is therefore a marginal being, all precaution against danger must come from others. So I might start by asking, who are the others? And without a doubt, it's us. And this has become my personal mission statement, my North Star, and I use it whenever I get some harebrained idea of creating something new. Does the new idea help protect the so-called marginal beings from danger? I invite you to adopt this for yourself. So that brings me to me. And I say that because how I got here or how any of us got here, here being on the side of vulnerable populations is always an intriguing story. In fact, just asked Dr. Myers about his time at the Bronx Developmental Center to gain some insight into his persona. This is my personal reserve parking space at my center in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And coming from Manhattan, where you must be a celebrity or head of a hedge fund to have a reserve parking space, negotiating for this when I was being recruited was like winning the lottery. It's been my greatest accomplishment in the 30 years I have been the director of the Habilitation Center at Orange Grove. And that is a great segue to explain exactly the difference between habilitation and rehabilitation. When I first saw the ad for my job in, uh, back in 1994 in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, I thought it was a misprint. They were asking for the director of the habilitation center. It was a term I had never heard of. Like you, probably I had heard and was familiar with rehabilitation, but it's not the same. Rehabilitation is the retraining and learning of skills that a person once had and no longer has. You can lose those skills through neurotrauma, degenerative neurological disease, aging, um, et cetera. The individuals that I have had the pleasure and privilege of working with never had these skills to begin with. So we're not rehabilitating them. We're not retraining them. We're simply training them from the onset. Interestingly enough, the term habilitation comes from the Latin word habilis, meaning to make suitable and to make fit. And that's what we do at my center. We try to teach folks how to do compensatory mechanisms for skills that they never had or have difficulty basically learning. And it's more than just that. 
it's a two-way street. So we make the society more applicable and more suitable for them, and not just by making curb cuts in the sidewalk, but by basically infiltrating every single institution to see the wisdom of incorporating this population into what we do. So Robert, can, I, can I interrupt you for just one second, Rick? Yes. Greater yes. Um, are you able to share your slides? Uh, yeah, hang on. Okay. Chrissy. Five slides aren't been shared. Come on. Shared. Isn't that it? It did. Click that. And it went through and did it. Hang on. Chrissy, do you need help there? Tell me, you can tell me what you're seeing. What are you seeing on there, Chrissy, on your screen? All right, let's see here. I clicked the share button and it didn't share. Um, let me see here. I'm so sorry. Okay. If you walk me through what you're seeing, I can try to help you. All right, so I'm looking at his PowerPoint. Okay. And... Are you looking at, can you see his PowerPoint after you hit share screen? Do you see his PowerPoint listed there? Because it, it took me to, right, so that Chrissy, if you go to Zoom, yes, where you okay. can see the your image and on the mm -hmm. bottom, there should be a green button that says share screen. Share screen, there it is. And then there should be windows that pop up and you should be able to see the PowerPoint. Perfect. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I knew I was missing a button. I was like, it should have went. Oh my, what did I do wrong? Okay, now we're good. <laughs> Thank you. I am so sorry. Don't worry. <laughs> All right, there we go. I forgot a button. She forgot a button. I forgot a button. Oh, well, where are we? Are we back to normal? We're back to normal. I forgot a button. Hit one more button though for me if you don't mind. <laughs> Which button? The button all the way to the bottom right that says that's the pre presentation button. Presentation button. So I have to hit the presentation button. You could go all the way up to the left, Chrissy. Uh huh. Right there. You could do from current slide. Yep. There we go. Thank you. All right. Now we got it. Six times the charm. Okay, are we okay now? We're good. We're good. Oh, we're good. Okay. Okay, so basically, um, I was just describing my, you know, my my claim to fame by having my own reserve parking space here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, and basically, uh, so it's interesting that dentists typically are intrigued by what got my interest in dentistry. It's the number one question I am typically asked at conferences. How did you, Dr. Rada, as a physician, get here? So here's the skinny. Here's the truth. My older brother is a dentist, and I have always looked up to him and admired him. Back in the 1960s, part of the application to dental schools required the applicant to submit a chalk carving. I watched my brother practice carving a piece of chalk to exacting specifications. And I thought that was pretty neat. So I decided to try it myself. He gave me some chalk and a wood handled knife and I spent hours on it. Finally, I presented it for his inspection. He rubbed his finger along one side of it and held it up to the light. Then he tossed it back to me and said, go to medical school. And, and I did. 
basically. And yes, that is me as a dashing young medical student about 40 years ago in London. Long white coat, pocket bulging with two beepers. And if you're not familiar with the term beeper, you can Google it. Um, none, of, none of us in medical school or in dental school, certainly at the time, received any training in developmental disabilities. But one day I did get an eye-opening experience that was to basically seal my fate. I was lucky enough to do my pediatric rotation at the Hospital for Sick Children or the Great Ormond Street Hospital. This was the singular prototype pediatric hospital in the world. And one day I got a note in my mailbox from my senior registrar that said, Mr. Rader, check out the FLK in Eleanor East. Eleanor East was one of the wards basically. And I went up there and it was an open ward. So there might've been 20 or 30 beds um, all stacked alongside one another. And I'm walking around looking for the FLK and one of the nurses spotted me and said, Mr. Rader, can I help you? And I said, yeah. I said, Dr. Neely told me to come up to look at the FLKs. I said, I'm clueless. And she looked at me and she said, if you can't check out the funny looking kids from the normal looking ones, maybe this is not the right profession. And there I was basically in, confronted with this first term FLK, funny looking kids. At the time, it wasn't, nor was it ever intended to be basically a derogatory term. It was simply a descriptive term to demarcate the unique novel facial dysmorphologies in kids with special syndromes, et cetera. Um, that idea, that term basically, and I still to this day have that note that was sitting in my mailbox in 1982 in basically inviting me to check out the funny looking kids, et cetera. Jump cut from there. Basically, I had a stint as a rural medical officer in the kingdom of Swaziland. And basically, I was encountered a lot of young kids with developmental disabilities at the time. This basically sealed my fate. And for some reason, I said, I need to know more. I need to earn more. And I need to certainly make more of an impression on people with this particular field. Anyhow, jump cut, basically, and now we're looking at 2002. The then U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. David Satcher, had the first ever task force in health disparities in people with mental retardation, which was the acceptable term at the time. And following three days of having doctors and dentists and social workers and psychologists gather together to figure out what can we do to basically increase the clinical outcomes of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities Satcher said something that was really, really shattering to us. And he said, I want to thank everybody for your participation in this task force. We have a great report, but basically, if you don't give legs to this report, it's just going to remain in the bowels of the U.S. printing office in the basement. And basically, that was our call to action. What could we possibly do to give this report called Closing the Gap some legs? And we finally figured it out. This was the blueprint to improve the health of people with mental retardation. So finally, the physicians and the dentists decided to join forces. We formed what is now known as the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. This is a true bicameral organization in which there is mutual respect and admiration between the physicians and also the dentists. As a matter of fact, to demonstrate that intercollegial atmosphere, that we buy basically our policy, we alternate between a dentist and a physician every two years in, in the form of being a president. Um, from my friendships and my collaboration with the dental side of the aisle, I learned that the oral health care was the number one unmet health care needs of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So I said, I got to get on to this. So as I said earlier, I did have a stint in Africa, and it's interesting in Africa, the tourists on safari are always looking to see the big five. In fact, they don't consider their safari a success if they haven't seen the big five. The big five, of course, are the lion, the hippo, the elephant, the cape buffalo, and the leopard. And basically, I'm using that and basically borrowing that concept of the big five to say, here are the big five that you will probably see most commonly in your waiting room. So basically, we have cerebral palsy. Fragile X, Down syndrome, autism, and nonspecific intellectual disabilities. Fragile X syndrome is the most common form of inherited intellectual and developmental disabilities. 
People with fragile X may not have noticeable symptoms, or they can have more serious symptoms that range from learning disabilities to cognitive and behavioral problems. Basically, people with CP have problems with movement and posture. Many also have related conditions. Probably 70% of folks with CP have an intellectual disability, coupled with seizures, problems with vision and hearing and speech, et cetera. We basically divide cerebral palsy into three groups based upon what part of the brain is effective. Stiff muscles are spasticity, uncontrollable movements are dyskinesia, and poor balance and coordination are ataxia. Probably everyone basically is familiar with, um, with Down syndrome. It appears in one in 800 um, live births. And basically they run the gambit from basically being concert pianists to basically being folks that really need support in every aspect of their life. Talking about the big five, I wanna take a step aside now and I wanna mention what we call the fatal five. These are the leading causes of preventable deaths among people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And the key word there is preventable deaths. So we have seizures, dehydration, aspiration, bowel obstruction, and infections and sepsis. In addition to that, basically, there's also 7,000 rare disorders or rare diseases. The majority of those things have... Um, um, have an intellectual disability as a coexisting condition. As an aside, the definition, at least in the United States, which basically compelled us to create the Orphan Drug Act, is it's a condition in which it affects 200,000 cases or less. And as mentioned before, you know, as a physician, it was an honor to be asked to write the introduction to this classic text on developmental disabilities, along with Karen Raposa and Steve Perlman, who is basically somebody you know, certainly. So what had happened was in a snowball effect, having garnered through some of those things, I was asked to lecture in several dental schools and was appointed as adjunct faculty to over a dozen schools. And basically from there, I was given the opportunity to basically officiate at white coat ceremonies and also at graduation ceremonies. So I got a shot at the incoming newbies as well as the outgoing graduates. One of the things that I did to every graduate and to every new coming um, student is I handed them this little card. It was about the size of a baseball card. And on one side, it had um, a tribute to DeMonte Driver. DeMonte Driver was a 12 year old young boy who woke up one day with a toothache. Um, and his mother took him to a couple of dentists, but basically there was some problem with the change of the address on his insurance card and nobody wanted to accept him. Basically, what had happened was he had this abscess with migrated to the brain, basically coming out with a full static encephalopathy, and he died. And basically what we found out was for 80 bucks for the extraction. So DeMonte Driver needlessly died of neglect, indifference, and inequality. And basically there have been laws passed, and basically DeMonte Driver is somebody that I carry in my wallet to this day. And the other side of the DeMonte driver card is what I call the dental bucket list. And basically it says, as a new dentist, I am committed to treating at least one patient in my career who cannot see me, cannot hear me, cannot thank me, cannot understand me, cannot high five me, cannot recall my name, cannot read. Is it the end of their life? They may not like me. They may be confused and scared. It might be somebody I once stigmatized. And it might not be somebody who might not be able to pay me. Somebody it might be who competes in Special Olympics and somebody who has lost their memory. And I've been giving the dental bucket list to both incoming and graduating dental students for over 10 years and without any fanfare or request to hear back from the students. It always amazes me to receive unsolicited ones from students who I don't personally know or possibly even could remember. Some of them have one check mark and some have several. And once in a while, I get one that has them all checked. Sometimes there is a handwritten scrawl, a note at the bottom that says, thank you, this has defined my career and reminded me of why I became a dentist to begin with. So one of the things I wanna share with you, I think it's important for you to appreciate how society has assigned social roles to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. This will at least provide the groundwork for you to understand how we justified the inhumane treatment we allowed and also committed. 
We went from the so-called medical model, where we thought disabilities were abhorrent and we needed to cure them, to the social model, where inclusion and mainstreaming was the goal, but did little to acknowledge the need for optimal health. And finally, to the biopsychosocial model that strives to approach the person as an individual with goals and aspirations and ensuring a safe and productive place beside us in the community. Along the way, we pulled their teeth, we sterilized them, we isolated them, we watched them rock back and forth on cement floors laying in their own feces. We spiked their oatmeal with radioactive iodine to study radiation poisoning. We injected them with hepatitis to do research. And we laid the groundwork for the pseudoscience of eugenics, better breeding to eliminate the morons, the idiots, the imbeciles, and the feeble-minded that clashed with our misguided vision of morality. It was the American eugenics movement that was used by the Nazis as a defense at the Nuremberg trials. It's noteworthy that the eugenics movement was not a policy promoted by some outlaw backwater unaccredited institution, but the elite universities like the Carnegie Institute and the Rockefeller Center. A sociologist in the 1970s named Wolf Wolfensberger basically gave his social role valorization these are the labels and basically the values and the roles that were given to these individuals in society to allow us to do the things that we did to them. So one of them was basically the retarded person as subhuman. And that was real, real important because if you basically categorize somebody as subhuman, basically all authority for decency goes out the window. Basically, if you look at them as a menace, you basically don't want them in your neighborhood. You don't want them in your backyard. You don't want them working in your stores and you don't want them going to your schools because they're a menace. You're an object of pity. So basically we feel sorry for them. Um, this was a little bit closer to humanity than basically fearing them as, as a menace. Basically a burden of charity. And when economic times are okay, yeah, we reach into our pockets to help them. But when things get tight, they're the first to go. We don't want burdens. Holy innocence, well, basically that took a little of the onus off of them. This was God's message to us for whatever reason we needed it. And basically the retarded person as defective. Finally, the retarded person as a developing individual. Let me say something about the use of the word retarded, or as we used to call it in Special Olympics, the R word. Years ago, I was a presidential appointee at the PCMR, PCMR was the President's Committee for Mental Retardation. And again, it was a term that was basically a clinically descriptive term. These terms basically like moron, imbecile, idiot, feeble-minded, mental deficient, basically, in my mind, as, a, as an anthropologist, they have a shelf life of about 20 years. And that's what happens when mainstream society hijacks these terms and applies them to people that we don't like people that we don't find are as attractive and people that we don't want on our, on our teams. So basically the President's Committee for Mental Retardation went on. It was one of the most respected you know, intellectual groups that we had. And one day a little girl came to us named Rosa and she says, I don't like it when people call me retarded. It hurts my feelings. Well, there I was. I was the special liaison for family health care concerns at the President's Committee for Mental Retardation. And I said, hey, we could change this. And literally overnight, we changed President's Committee for Mental Retardation to the President's Committee for People with Intellectual Disabilities. Now, we were all set to applaud each other and to release the white doves. But unknowingly, what we did in doing that is we eliminated services and eligibility for five and a half million individuals. Because in the in the federal statutes, the term intellectual disabilities did not exist. And what happened virtually the next day, a mom would take her daughter to the social worker to enroll her in special uh, programs. And the social worker looking at a screen would say, and what's your daughter's disability? And the mom would say she has an intellectual disability. Well, they would look down the screen and not see it and say, sorry, no eligibility. You know, who's next? Literally, what had happened was the formal term mental retardation was embedded in federal statutes defining eligibility. So we basically knocked on President Obama's door and say, you got to fix this. 
And he did. He passed Rose's law, basically named after the little girl who said, I don't like being called retarded. And Rose's law basically removed the terminology of mental retardation from federal statutes and substituted it with intellectual disabilities. So from that, basically, we also have stigma. And Irvin Goffman was a sociologist in the 1970s who laid the foundations for stigma as a social policy. He very, very cleverly described stigma as, quote, stolen identity. And when you think about it, that's what we do when we stigmatize somebody. We steal their identity. And worse than that, we basically reappoint them with another identity. So it would be like telling this audience of dentists that I'm speaking to tonight that starting tomorrow, none of you would be able to refer to yourselves as dentists or doctors, but you would be relegated to being identified as tooth decay monitors. Identity was stolen and then another one was reassigned. And it's all about the power gradient and control. So here's the kicker. In a recent study published in the Journal of Health Affairs, more than 80% of U.S. physicians reported that people with significant disabilities have worse quality of lives than non-disabled people. It's an attitude that may contribute to the healthcare disparities among people with disabilities. It was the first of its kind study surveying practicing physicians from multiple specialties and locations across the country about their attitudes towards patients with disabilities. Lead author, my colleague, is a physician at Harvard Medical School and since 1980, Lisa Anzanosi has been a wheelchair user as a result of her MS. So she has firsthand experience in the hurdles of access to care for people with disabilities. Only 40% of surveyed physicians reported feeling very confident about their ability to provide the same quality of care to patients with disabilities as their other patients. And just 56% strongly agreed that they would welcome patients with disabilities into their practices, providing they had the skills. The physicians who reported being most welcoming to patients with disabilities were female and practiced at academic medical centers. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 requires that people with disability receive equitable health care across the lifespan. So if physicians discredit and devalue the lives of people with disabilities, what can we expect realistically from the rest of society? When physicians say, quite frankly, we just don't see the point. So rather than, again, release the doves and say, gee, how wonderful it is for everyone, every dentist and every hygienist to take care of our individuals, no one ever said this was a walk in the park. And basically, I'm not pulling any punches when I want to share with you some of the co-occurring conditions that make these a very, very challenging group of patients to encounter. So on top of everything, they have seizure disorders. The seizure prevalence in the general population is 1.8%. The seizure prevalence in people with IDD is 26%. 70% respond to treatment and to have good outcomes, while 30 to 40% are treatment resistant. People with intellectual disabilities have five times the mental illness of non-ID individuals. That being said, the accuracy of a psychiatric diagnosis is questionable. Psychiatrists often have to rely on the reports from caregivers or parents. They may also confuse behavioral issues for psychiatric manifestations. People with ID are two to three times more likely to be diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and 3% of the ID population has a diagnosis of schizophrenia compared to 0.8% of the general population. Psychiatrists, like all clinicians, don't receive adequate training in intellectual disabilities, so in many cases, it's like the Wild West when it comes to diagnosis. And of course, we have behavioral, which is probably the bane of most dentists, hearing that they have somebody with autism or with a behavioral problem. The most important axiom is to understand and appreciate that behavior is the means by which people with intellectual disabilities communicate with you. Many of their behaviors may be unconventional symptoms of psychiatric disorders. Among many manifestations of behavior, we see impulse control, poor frustration tolerance, low self-esteem, self-injurious behavior, aggressive destructive behavior, obsessive behavior, fixations, self-isolations, repetitive self-stimulating, echolalia, and inappropriate personal space. And of course, we have sensory disorders, and there are few things more sensory disruptive than going to a dentist. 
First, we have to dismiss the long-held belief that we have five senses. The truth is that we have upwards of over 30, and each of them can be impaired, dysfunctional, or imprecise, all leading to social distraction and problematic compensatory accommodations, not to mention barriers to completing tasks and interacting with people, including clinicians. We have vestibular, proprioceptive, kinesthetic, thermoceptive, somatosensory, nociceptive, and a host of others. Sensory processing is simply the neurology of how we feel. The senses send us signals, both individually and in combination, to provide us with information about where we are in nature and what to make of the way the nature impacts on us. They help us navigate both the pain and pleasure that await us at every social turn. As an aside, a trip to the dentist, perhaps the most sensory, disruptive, traumatic, and intimidating experience for an individual with an intellectual and developmental disabilities. It basically competes with getting a haircut, as is often the case for us, but it doesn't have to be that way. We also, on top of everything else, have communication processing problems. Research demonstrates that over 60% of participants with IDDD experience communication difficulties with over 25% reporting severe difficulties. Only 75% of participants communicated verbally. More than half found communicating with professionals and non-familiar partners difficult. The level of ID, low social participation, challenging behaviors, and diagnosis of Down syndrome was significantly associated with communication difficulties. We often encounter echolalia, where the individuals continue to mimic and repeat what the caregiver is saying. This is often mistakenly interpreted as a provocative or inciting or basically seductive gesture, and caregivers and clinicians have to avoid overreacting to this. Most nonverbal individuals do not use standard American Sign Language, but a hybrid often created between them and their parents or direct support professionals. Some use electronic communication devices, while some still use simple, basically, illustrations. Of course, we have polypharmacy. Individuals with IDDD are particularly vulnerable to the slings and arrows of polypharmacy. It is not unusual for many of my patients to take 15 to 20 prescription drugs with multiple drugs taken from the same therapeutic classification. Over 80% of psychotropic drugs are prescribed without a bona fide psychiatric diagnosis. They are often prescribe to control behaviors or basically to counteract the side effects of so many different drugs. The cocktails are responsible for a myriad of side effects, allergic reactions, drug-drug interactions, drug-food interactions. Often the side effects are addressed by prescribing additional drugs, which cause additional side effects. Often referrals to specialists result in additional drugs or the discontinuation of drugs by other physicians. There is very little interdisciplinary consultation. Most drugs are continued without being evaluated, reconsidered, or given a drug holiday. To make matters worse, most of the drugs in the, in the clinical trials have not used folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities as part of the subject matters. So in essence, it's basically a crapshoot. We don't know basically what the half-life of certain drugs are in certain of these situations. We don't know what the basically excretion rates are. And basically, we don't really know what the, the dosages are. The NIA, the National Institute of Aging of the National Institute of Health, has recently established the Center for Deprescribing Research to investigate strategies to better understand, mitigate, and address polypharmacy. Then we have accelerated aging. Down syndrome has long been considered what's known as a progeroid syndrome, as individuals with trisomy 21 start to age prematurely and present precociously conditions usually characteristics of the geriatric population. The aging process in Down syndrome subjects not only seems to be premature and accelerated, but also appears to be atypical and segmental as it recapitulates many, but not all of the classical signs and symptoms of aging. Clinically, Down syndrome subjects present signs of early aging affecting particularly the neurological system with their extremely high prevalence of dementia of Alzheimer's type. One of the reasons for that is the culprit chromosome, the 21st chromosome, um, that is basically the culprit for folks with Down syndrome. In you and I, as neurotypical, the 21st chromosome also happens to be the site of the deposition of the amyloid tau, which basically is the, um, the culprit in um, Alzheimer's disease. 
So if you have three times the genetic material on that culprit chromosome, it's no wonder that you're going to get, you know, a higher prevalence. Aging also affects prematurely the dermatological, sensory, endocrine, and musculoskeletal systems, leading to high levels of mortality and multimorbidity in this population. Individuals with IDD have a lifespan that is 20 years less than neurotypical individuals. In many genetic syndromes and conditions, we see early signs of aging, and we are starting to see that as we study biomarkers of aging, an example being the so-called the epigenetic clock. An epigenetic clock is a biochemical test that can be used to measure age. The test is based on DNA methylization levels. This is one of my favorites, diagnostic overshadowing. So here's how that works. Say a parent brings a child, a 39-year-old male with Down syndrome, to the physician and reports a recent onset of confusion and difficulty recognizing household objects. The physician has read or heard that people with Down syndrome have a high proclivity to developing Alzheimer's disease and shares with the mother. I'm not surprised since he probably has dementia and those symptoms are part of it. Well, individuals with Down syndrome do have a high prevalence of developing Alzheimer's disease. The confusion could also be a form of a different condition, like a urinary tract infection or a drug interaction. This is an example of diagnostic overshadowing where the physician clinician over attributes new signs and complaints to the overarching syndrome. It has its roots in bias, devaluation of the patient and an attitude that says, what's the difference anyhow? It is probably grounds for malpractice. It's certainly dangerous, unprofessional, unethical and sloppy. Diagnostic overshadowing is most often seen with patients with mental illness, intellectual and developmental disabilities, elderly patients, and patients from disparate groups. The Joint Commission um, recently released what is known as the Sentinel Alert on Diagnostic Overshadowing. Joint Commission basically accredits hospitals. It's a warning that this practice is prevalent, unacceptable, and opens the hospital and physicians to liability, including loss of accreditation and forfeiting CMS funding. Clinical medicine is not the only place we see diagnostic overshadowing. It happens in dentistry as well. Based on bias, we know that GERD is underdetected. Candidiasis from drooling is not addressed. Facial neurologists like tick dollaru, Bell's palsy, sleep apnea, chronic abscess, post-procedure pain, TMJ, trauma, which can be the result of caregiver abuse, is blown off as self-abusive behavior. Osteonecrosis of the jaw from biophosphonates, persistent dental infections, casually treated by antibiotics, and no vigorous pursuit of the etiology no biopsy of the lesion, and they miss a squamous cell carcinoma. We have identified a population of physicians and dentists that are not prone to practicing diagnostic overshadowing. We attribute this to the so-called cognitive complexity of the clinician, which refers to the tendency of the clinician to view a presenting problem in a multi-dimensional fashion. Clinicians basically have a greater cognitive complexity have been reported to be more likely to detect comorbid populations. So. Let me share with you some of the myths about dental patients with IDD. So what is it that we hear about these people that basically give us preconceived orientation about the negative aspects of engaging with them? So basically, these people have high thresholds for pain. That's a myth. Pain tolerance is the maximum level of pain that a person is able to tolerate. Pain tolerance is distinct from pain threshold, which is the point at which pain begins to be felt. The perception of pain that goes into pain tolerance has two major components. First is the biological component, the headache or skin prickling that activates pain receptors. Second is the brain's perception of pain, how much focus is spent paying attention to or ignoring the pain. The brain's perception of pain is a response to signals from pain receptors that sense the pain in the first place. If anything, our individuals don't have a higher threshold for pain. They have a low tolerance and an inability to basically communicate or express pain sensations. They have basically no way of describing intensities or origins. You can't get away with somebody without population to saying on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the worst pain you ever had in your life, what is that? Um, another myth is basically they need to be treated in the OR, all of them. I refer to the practice of sending everybody to the OR as Larry the cable guy mentality. He was fond of saying, get her done. And while people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, some of them do, like neurotypicals, need to be treated in the OR, 
you know, the wholesale use of the OR to get things done is just inappropriate and basically does a disservice to our individual. Plus the fact that our individuals basically, you know, they don't have great airway clearance. So you don't want to basically put them under a general anesthetic, you know, whenever possible. Um, another great myth is that these people need to be treated by specially trained dentists. And while we can certainly say that there are specially trained dentists, and we certainly hope, you know, that Toro will produce their share of those individuals that will go into special care dentistry. Basically, the average dentist who wants to use the time, ingenuity, and patience can successfully pay, basically treat probably 80% of these individuals. We find that, you know, in, in medicine, you know, specialists, we, we call it the 80% or 85% rule. That basically says that the average family practice doc or the average internist can treat 80% of all the conditions that are presented to him. And basically the, the other 20, 15, 20% should be sent to a specialist. Unfortunately, what we see the specialist reporting back to us that they're not sending, um, they're not seeing you know, 80% of the, of the population. It's more like 65% of the population. And basically, they use the specialists basically to get rid of patients that they find uninviting, unappealing, or basically a waste of time. So basically, this is something that basically needs to be addressed um, by the dental schools. These people all need to be papoosed. And again, some of them are and some of them don't. You know, we need to basically do a better job of desensitizing people. One of the things that we need to do is we need better reimbursement for those null activities where somebody comes in at my dental clinic at Orange Grove. You know, it's not unusual for someone to come in three or four times without ever getting into the chair. They come in, they dance with the hygienist students, they may play a game of Miss Pac-Man, and they're out the door. But basically, we get it down the road because if we don't have to send them to the OR or we don't have to sedate them, um, we could papoose them, basically... Um, it's not unusual for folks who are being papoosed actually seek it out once they come back to the clinic because they love that basically concealing feeling that gives them, you know, the security. And certainly, you know, these people don't show up for appointments. And a lot of that is true because a lot of the folks that you're going to be seeing in your clinic are coming from group homes in the community. Group homes are understaffed. They have to have very, very staffed individual ratios. So if you have a group home with four people, basically, and one has to go to the, de to the dentist, and basically one of them has to go to church, or one of them has to go to Special Olympics practice, and you only have one van or two vans, and you only have two staff, you know, that's a problem. Um, and they don't show up for appointments. Unfortunately, we cannot charge them, um, but we basically do everything we possibly can um, to make sure that they do. Um, the other myth is these people compromise your bottom line. And in fact, I feel and I propose that the skills, techniques, and the innovative approaches to clinical care working with this population can help your bottom line by increasing your efficiency, your productivity, and the office morale, and basically being able to transform those things and your new energy to your typical patients. This is a big myth, and basically this does a disservice to the individuals, basically, that you're going to see. These people are not always happy. They're not always sad either. They're just basically people that experience the full spectrum of the emotional things that life basically has to pay. Um, we do a disservice. We think that they're just full of joy and fun, and they just want to be hugged, Um they give that impression because they don't get hung up on the things that you and I get hung up on. And basically a lot of the unhappiness and the stress is eliminated. Um, and basically it transfers into, into positive energy. And likewise, basically once these people are always happy is a myth. We also have the myth that dentists are always compassionate, empathetic, and kind. Well, we know how far that will go. So, let me go a little past what you might have think as well. God, Dr. Rady, you just named all of the reasons why we're hesitant about seeing this population. So let me show you some of the good stuff. We got this. And basically, I want to share with you some of the milestones by three groups that basically I have had the privilege of dealing with the National Council on Disability, 
the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry, and Project Accessible Oral Health. So with Project Accessible Oral Health, and there is, of course, is everybody's hero. That's, um, um, that's Steve Perlman, who basically was the originator of Special Smiles and the Healthy Athletes Program. Um, PAOH has launched an All Smiles Shine. It's a comprehensive outreach effort sponsored by Delta Dental, Colgate, and Henry Shine. And the campaign includes educational materials, training for oral healthcare professionals, an app to help individuals with disabilities with oral-based home care, and a global oral health initiative. The AADMD, the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry, that was the group that was the outbirth of basically of um, Surgeon General Satch's suggestion to give this meeting some legs, and that's what we did. We basically recreated a policy on stabilization and immobilization. You know, we threw out the concept of a restraint, and we actually used the stabilization and immobilization model used by the ASEP, the American College of Emergency Physicians. Emergency physicians basically have no problem basically stabilizing and immobilizing somebody if they're going to remove a foreign object out of a kid's nose or out of his ear, or if they basically have to start an IV on a young kid or basically give him the shot. You try some of those mobilization techniques basically in a dental office. For some reason, many, many dentists basically um, are accused of, um, of abuse and, and, and other things. So basically by the adoption of the AADMD policy on stabilization and immobilization that basically is underwritten by the American College of Emergency Physicians, we give equity to physicians as well as to dentists. Organ transplant equity is famous basically this is based on a famous case called Amelia's case. And Amelia was a 12-year-old girl with wolf Herschel and, uh, syndrome. And she needed, um, she, needed a, she needed a kidney transplant. And her mother took uh, um, Amelia to CHOP, Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia. CHOP is probably the number one pediatric organ transplant center in the United States. And there she was sitting in a room across the table from a transplant surgeon, from the head of nursing, from basically the head of um, the ethics committee and the head of the legal committee and the head of social work. And basically the surgeon looked at Amelia who was bouncing on the, uh, the lap of her mother and said, we don't waste organs on kids like that. Basically that infuriated the AADMD. And basically we, um, we, we rolled up our sleeves, we put on our eye patches, and we basically went out to slit some throats. And basically, you know, under the um, Uniform um, Anatomical Gift Act, the use of a person's disability in equating their equitable acceptability for receiving an organ basically is outlawed. In addition to that, we are basically encouraging families to consider having their children with the developmental disabilities becoming organ donors at the same time. And basically there is no contraindication for any organ transplant for somebody with an intellectual disability that doesn't exist in the neurotypical world, basically. During the pandemic alert, you know, vaccines, ventilators, PPEs, um, and ICU access were denied for our individuals. We actually had to go to the Office of Civil Rights of the United States Department of Health and Human Services to sue those state departments of health that basically had these draconian pandemic alerts that prohibited access for our population. Um, DNR decision-making, fight to end infant mutil mutilization, basically mutilation in, in Sub-Saharan Africa access to end-of-life care for people with IDD. At a point in time, nobody would even consider allowing um, an intervention with hospice because the state medical board was saying, what do you mean this person's going to die? You know, it was basically, um, it was frowned upon because if you called in hospice, it basically meant that you were giving up. We also have made great inroads in our national curriculum initiative in developmental medicine. This basically is coming out with a standardized curriculum that will ensure that graduates of medical schools basically will be exposed to not just the psychosocial aspects of it, but roll up your sleeves and the clinical needs to learn how to communicate with our population, families, and their caregivers as well. So that was something. And here's something, you know, the, 
I would call this the three amigos. And the AADMD in a historic for the first time three years ago was able to basically entertain and bring the president of the American Medical Association along with the president of the American Dental Association to a round table discussion um, at the AADMD. And basically we got the president of both the AMA and the president of the ADA to publicly admit that both organized medical and dental organizations were asleep at the wheel when it came to addressing the health disparities of this population. This was not just a photo op, but basically we have been working for three years on ongoing prototypical campaigns to ensure that both the AMA and the ADA supports what we're trying to achieve. Let me also share with you the National Council on, on Disability, some of their milestones, et cetera. Basically, we have increased through the um, National Council on Disability, increasing the coverage of Medicaid oral health care. Basically, we were able to get code of the Council on Dental Accreditation to basically ensure that competency training of dental patients for folks with disabilities. And probably in the greatest coup that we could imagine, we actually got the American Dental Association to basically amend their code of ethics to include taking care of patients with disabilities as part of the AD ethics code. We also co-created and wrote the health equity framework, which laid out a framework for all healthcare policies and programs that basically need to have equity for folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And something that was still going on, it's a work in progress, and that's getting the federal government to formally acknowledge and designate people with intellectual and developmental disabilities as being a bona fide medically underserved population. This would allow um, medical school and dental school loan forgiveness for those clinicians that work with uh, people in this particular field, um, as well as opening up billions of dollars of research grants that have been reserved just for MUP populations. So um, kudos for them to doing that. Um, Inclusion of people with disabilities and emergency preparedness in every single national emergency. You know, we have seen folks being left out in the margins in terms of not making, not ensuring that basically um, emergency shelters were prepared to take out population, that basically group homes had emergency bags packed and ready to go. Uh, the organ transplant non-discrimination bill, um, enforceable medical equipment, you know, if you can't weigh somebody in a wheelchair in a medical office, then you de don't know whether or not their weight reduction and weight management program is doing. If you don't know what their total weight is, sometimes medication is based upon body weight, so you can't do that. Um, same thing, you know, you need to have um, you need to have lifts to basically remove somebody from a wheelchair to put them on a an examination table so that you could do a proper examination. All too often, I see patients coming into our clinic, and basically we see abdominal exam. It says deferred. Deferred just means we didn't do it. Um, oh, yeah. And the Americans with Disabilities Act. When one of the things, one of the problems with the Americans with Disabilities Act, when it was enacted, you know, there was very, very little resources for basically enforcement. And that's changing now. And we're going after the big ones. We're going after the Kaiser Permanentes, and we're going after the United Healthcare. And we're going after the Cleveland Clinic to make sure that they basically are in compliance with the physical compliance of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So that's that's a coup. And OK, now that you've got that under your belt, it's quiz time and not just a quiz, but the most diabolical of any quiz, the spot quiz, the unannounced quiz. But I have confidence in you getting through this. So here's the first question. Here's a photo of a dental school early dental school, probably the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, I'm sure you know that the first dental school was opened in 1840. So that's over 180 years ago. So the question is, what can you observe about this class? Hint, it's not that they're not wearing gloves or masks. Question number two, here's a photo of dental students at a prominent dental school at the turn of the 21st century. The question is, What's different about them? Well, obviously the early photo shows that the class is composed totally of male students. 
while well, the current photo of the new Dental School shows a dramatic increase in female students. Today, women make up 51.4% of dental students. Back in 1970, they made up only 1%. So it's a huge shift. So congratulations if you got that right. Okay, jump cut, basically. So now the enchilada question is, there's the photo of the school then, and here's a photo of the class today. What do they have in common? The answer is none of the students in both photos treated a single patient with an intellectual disability. In fact, they didn't treat a single patient with any kind of disability. Despite over 120 years of progress in dental education, not one student ever saw, greeted, met, talked to, spent time with, or treated a person with a disability. So in essence, we have failed that quiz. We have failed that population. We have failed that community and we have failed society. But I have confidence in both the medical and dental professions to right the wrong. It's evident that with the committed leadership of institutions like Turo, under the watchful eye of Ronnie, Susan, and Raquel, we can be more confident that the upcoming generations of dentists will have the confidence, experience, and commitment to treat people with intellectual and developing disabilities. By the way, I was always intent on learning to care and how to carve chalk. It's true. Practice makes perfect. Thank you. Wow. That was a fantastic lecture, Dr. Rader. Thank you so much. You. I have no idea how you managed to touch on every single topic in the span of exactly an hour. That was yeah. really impressive. And what might well, be- I, I, certainly, I certainly wasn't gonna cut off the uh, slide of my, uh, of my carved chalk chess pieces. Well, that's what I was gonna say. That might be the most impressive of all. Right. Very good. No, thank you so much. I mean, you really touched on every single topic that I, I know that Dr. Desenso speaks on in her course and that we really, you know, preach to our students. And thank you just for going into all the detail that you went into. We really appreciate your time. And I want to just give a second here to look and ask for any questions that anybody might have for Dr. Rader. Okay. Okay, I ex I escaped. You answered them all before oh. they could even ask any. But thank you for ending that all on such a positive note, and all of the the ventures that um, that the milestones that have been accomplished, and but also bringing it back to that last slide of how much work is still yet to be done. Um, we are quite aware of that here at Toro, and we're committed to to putting in the work and doing the work. Um, that, that you have helped lay the groundwork for. So thank you again. My pleasure. Amazing. Dr. Desenso, do you want to share our last couple slides before we sign off? Absolutely. Okay, I just want to bring your attention to this Sunday, November 19th. We do have our Unit Zero, the Dental Educators Summit on Caring for People with Disability. We have about seven lectures um, that are planned for Sunday, and that means seven free CEs. Um, we look forward to seeing many of you there uh, this weekend as there's a lovely lineup of presenters, including Dr. Steve Perlman, who Dr. Rader uh, mentioned today in his lecture, um, Dr. Alan Wong, who was the past uh, president of AADMD. So a lot of familiar um, names that you may have heard just in this lecture alone. Um, but then again, he touched on everything and I still don't know how he did it by eight o'clock. Um, so thank you again, and remember your evaluation forms to receive your CE credits tonight. And hold on one moment, because I think we may have one question. Um, 
Dr. Martinez is asking, what do you think is the most important change that needs to occur in order to improve the provision of care to this population? Well, as, as they say, thank you for that question. I think basically the thing that has to change is basically societal values. And basically that has to happen before pre-dent. That has to happen before dental school. It has to happen basically in the playgrounds. It has to happen in the cafeterias. It has to happen in the audiences, you know, in the assemblies, in basically mainstream schools. We need to continue to mainstream and have inclusion classrooms because basically we need the next generation growing up basically in a calm, considered, and respectful view. We can't basically spring these folks onto people once you get into professional school. You know, I keep telling my medical students that medical school and dental school is a trade school. It's not a seminary. And you bring to the classroom and you bring to the lecture hall and you bring to the labs basically all your preconceived notions that you grew up with. And so I think the answer to that question is we need exposure, we need inclusion, and we need equity. Very well said. I literally couldn't have said it better myself because I wouldn't have been able to. Very well said. Let me see if there's anything else. Okay. I think that may be all of our questions. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Okay. Happy early Thanksgiving. You as well. To you. Thanks to everyone for being here. Good night.